Good morning, Doug here from the Hundredfold Journey. Thanks for joining us this Sundays with Doug, where we are coming alongside of you on your journey, and we're helping you to come up with uh, tools and resources on your spiritual journey to rewire your brain, build new habits, and create a new identity. Because a hundredfold is about a group of people who are looking to find their true identity and by doing so finding God's true identity because you do have the power to choose. So welcome to the Sundays with Doug. Uh, one of the tools in our toolbox is memorizing, applying and meditating the 10 truths. And these truths are true for Jesus and therefore they are true for you because as he is, so I am in this world because everything that his hand touched prospered, right? If he healed a blind man or fed the 5,000, everything that his hand touched prospered. And that's the same for us. Sometimes we don't believe it, but it is true. Everything that our hand touches prospers and circumstances don't matter, only state of being mattered. And again, for Jesus, it was all him about, about love and compassion and uh, whatever happened around him did not change his focus on, on what he was about and who he was. And that is the same for us. So again, this is one of the tools in your toolbox. Uh, so please work on memorizing these, applying these and meditating upon these. Because we are God's perfect reflection. First John 4, 17 says, as he is, so I am in this world. And Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And then John 14.20, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. So we are one. There's no separation. God is not out there somewhere. He is in me. And in fact, uh, our next study will be, I am the dwelling place of God. He dwells in me, and there is no separation. I'm his dwelling place. So today we're actually on a review of the seven I am statements found in the book of John. So each week this last week, uh, these last few weeks have been talking about the I am statements and we'll be going through that uh, this morning as a review. Uh, so again, the last seven weeks have been talking about each one of these statements. And today I thought it would be a good idea just to kind of wrap them up and just kind of make sure that we understand uh, what each one of these are. And then uh, our next study will launch into uh, the uh, I am the temple or the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God. All right. So um, the first one is, and this was the homework assignment this last week. And the homework assignment, again, can be found on our website at the hundredfoldjourney.com. And that worksheet is found in the Sundays with Doug. And each week there are some questions to, uh, to fill out. And this last week, we basically were talking about each one of the I am statements and what these mean to you and they how they show up in your life. So we could call this a, a quiz as well, a review, <laughs> um, exactly kind of what you learned about being the bread of life. Uh, and each one of these I am statements. So we'll start with the first one. Uh, I am the bread of life, which is found in John chapter six, which, uh, which says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread, <clears throat> excuse me. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So for those that are, that are online, uh, what do you remember about this study and how does this show up in your life? That um, the true nourishment of my soul comes from Jesus. And it, thinking of how it shows up in my life, I go to one of the 10 truths of being um, all of my needs are constantly met. And that one, I kept trying to find <clears throat> another way to word it or some, something else, but everything, it just kept coming back to that. It was like, yeah, but all my needs are constantly met. 
So what happens, <clears throat> how does that happen? How, how, so does that mean that every situation, every circumstance, all your needs are constantly met? You know, maybe, maybe give me an example of <clears throat> how that is displayed in your life. How do they, sh how does it show up? When I feel that I'm lacking in something, like if you use hunger or if I use, um, I don't have enough entertainment maybe or enough of a social life. Yeah. Um, and I think that I'm lacking if I just remember, you know, Jesus is in me. He's my nourishment. He provides me everything that I need, if I don't have it, is it really something that I need? Mm. Is it really something that's going to benefit my life at this moment? Yeah. Yeah. And for me, at least in all the situations I've come across, the answer has been, no, I'm good. <laughs> all right. That's good. That's good. And I really like how you phrase that. You don't, the external, the external needs that you think you have because it's our five senses, our five physical senses, you know, mm -hmm. touch, taste, smell, uh, feel, um, hear, that um, you think you have a need and you think that needs to be fulfilled outside. But in reality, it's all your needs are constantly met because the source is on the inside. Yeah. It's that, and, and there's, there's another verse that came to my mind, it's hidden manna. It's, it's manna that you can't see um, because it's in you. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> the result of that is that um, there's there's a lack of fear, there's a lack of anxiousness or worry, <clears throat> because like the uh, the children in the wilderness. In fact, I'll I'll just jump to this. Uh, this was the example, right? Is is manna uh, would come down every single morning. And the Israelites would go out and they would basically pick up off the ground uh, the dew of the morning, which turned into manna. And that would be their need for that day. And they weren't worried. In the beginning, they were worried and anxious about how they were going to be fed. But then after God provided for them every single morning, nonstop for 40 years, then they didn't have to worry or be anxious about it because they knew the provision would be there. It would be there the next morning, if you will. Mm -hmm. So the outcropping, the outcome of us knowing that all of our needs are constantly met, it's as if it's five o'clock in the afternoon on a Monday and you're worrying already about tomorrow tomorrow morning, am I going to have enough food? Well, no, because yesterday and the day before and the day before God provided, therefore you don't have to be fearful or anxious or worried because you know that all your needs are constantly met. So there's a peace that comes. There's a, uh, uh, yeah, just, just a peace that comes that knows that that, that yeah. is true for you. And then the other example is communion, right? It's, it's making the invisible visible. So those things that, uh, that, that hidden manna that's inside of you, uh, when we eat upon the bread, which is, which is God's word and that spirit that's in us and knowing that it's there and we drink of, of the, the wine, then this is, this is, we're demonstrating what's inside of us. Uh, we're making the invisible visible. All right, cool. Uh, going on to the next one, uh, the next I am statement. I am the light of the world. And this one is John 8. Then Jesus spoke to them and said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So again, same, same question. You know, what does this mean to you? And how does this show up in your life? Um, following Jesus. His light will lead me out of darkness and 
when I think of like bad times that I've had in my life, it, even when I'm going through them, it, everything does seem kind of dark. And when I look back at the memories, it's almost like looking at a black and white movie in my mind, the memories are in black and white, but yet the reverse is also true. The happiest times in my life, everything is bright. The memories are bright. And, um, it, even like if, I have a, a moment or a day where I'm feeling really down. I just kind of think of Jesus. I think of his light. And if I just could take a moment and meditate on that, it really will make a difference in how I'm feeling right at that time, regardless of the situation or the circumstance. Excellent. So what is the darkness that we walk in? I That's guess it could be definition. I don't know what the definition would be. Um, it it could just be for me. It's just any time that is um, filled with sadness or with grief or depression or even a time where I'm doing things that I know I should not be doing. I have no business doing that. Um, that would be my definition of it, at least. Yeah. Yeah, and the way <clears throat> the way I would view it would be believing or trusting in my own definitions or circumstance. You know, the way I view it is mm -hmm. I'm looking at it through what I call the fallen mindset, which is I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. God is over there. He's angry at me. I'm a sin. I'm a sinful man and I'm doing all this wrong and God is not pleased with me. All of those things. That's Feeling separated. Fallen. Right, exactly. Sorry. Separated that uh, there's separation. And that, that to me is darkness because it's, it's, uh, it's pushing down who I truly am. And I'm not agreeing with what God says about me and who I am. So when I don't agree, then I'm listening to that in, internal voice that says I'm not worthy, I'm not all of the, those things. And that to me is darkness, right? It's, uh, um, and I, I, I think of uh, Adam and Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden, right? They ate of the fruit. And they went and they hid themselves and they tried to cover themselves with the fig leaves. Um, that is darkness. That's the, uh, the fallen mindset that they're separated. And the beauty about that story is where was God that whole time? He was out looking for Adam saying, Adam, you know, who told you you were naked, right? Who told you you were separated from me? No, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I never left you. So, so again, when we're in the light, then what, what that means to me is that we're, we're not listening to, to the side that says you're not worthy. You are worthy as Jesus is. So am I in this world. That's light. <clears throat> yeah. um, so the light, uh, the light, uh, there was one example about the symbolism that was used and in the Old Testament, and we're going to be talking about this in a lot more detail in our next study, but uh, talking about the, uh, uh, the golden lampstand and how Jesus calls us the light of the world. So we just don't think we are. He told us we are the light of the world. Um, so what we are is we're this lampstand that has seven... Uh, that have seven holders of oil and uh, that oil represents the Holy Spirit. And when in Acts chapter two, when God's spirit was poured out on all flesh, it says that the, uh, the flame came upon the people like a, uh, a tongue, how does it say? A tongue of flame or flaming tongue on top of everybody. And I really like this picture because it kind of almost shows that we are the light and the light is in us. Um, so we are the light of the world. Mm -hmm.
There it is. I knew it was there somewhere. They see, they saw that seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and sat on each one of them. And I really like this, uh, you know, we are in this darkness, if you will, of our own understanding, our fallen mindset. And it's not until our eyes shift and focus on the cross and what Christ did for us that we truly understand who we are. And that light of the cross, the light, the love of God um, bursts into the darkness and awakens us and pulls us out of that darkness. All right, uh, next one is, I am the door of the sheep found in John chapter 10. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Then I'll just jump to verse seven. Then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So describe in your own words what each of these, uh, what this I am statement means to you and how it shows up in your life as being the door of the sheep. Uh, Jesus's love and protection is surrounding me unconditionally. Um, and the unconditionally part, whether it's with his him Jesus being the door or his love anything to me that I know is unconditional um is just really overwhelmingly powerful in the best possible way because I grew up with a lot of conditions on my behavior mm -hmm. and when I do start feeling separated like you were talking about before if I just remember that that it, Jesus is love and his care for me is unconditional that could pull me right back to where i want to be love it that's great I, I really like how you phrase that so now with that knowing how then does that show up in your life i it gives me confidence confidence and in what in in my beliefs actually and my emotions um, i trust in myself a lot more um, again back to the conditions growing up with the word a lot of times i was told i shouldn't feel what i was feeling i shouldn't obviously behave how i was behaving but you know that's to be expected but even as an adult i was still being told that and um it's just nice to trust myself and my heart and what I'm feeling and what I want and to know that I'm loved regardless, even if what I'm feeling isn't the right thing. It's my thing. Good. So, so now that you have that understanding, so now that's, that's demonstrated in your life, and, and I'll just answer the question for you because I, I, okay. what I was looking for was now that you have an understanding, we, and I'll use the word we, us, me, now that I have an understanding that I am loved unconditionally, that there's nothing that I can do to change God's opinion of me, I can then express that to other people, mm -hmm. right? So I can be that door that door of unconditional love that is basically open, right? When, and I'll just use you as an example, growing up and hearing that you had to do all those things. It was a door that was open, closed, open, closed. You, you do all the right things and that door is open for you and yeah. God is coming in and out and he loves you and, and everything's great. You're good, you're good. But then you, you feel, then they tell you, well, now you blew it. And so now the door is closed, right? Um, so for us to today love other people unconditionally because we know how we've been loved unconditionally, 
that door is open and there's nothing that anybody can do that can change God's opinion of them. It's unconditional love. Yeah. So how that shows up in our life is, you know, those people that cut us off on the side of, you know, in their car or, or, um, you know, that friend or family member or CNN news or whatever, uh, <laughs> no, it doesn't, it doesn't trigger us. Uh, we yeah. see it for what it is. Yeah. But it's not until we understand fully God's love for me that I can then demonstrate that and be the door for others. Others. And then on top of that, it's not until I love myself unconditionally because we're our hardest critic, right? Yeah. And sometimes we're too hard on ourselves, but when we love ourselves unconditionally, that's also very important because you can't give what you don't have. And I think we've talked about this where we need to be that life-giving spirit that we need to fill our cup first. And in, in Psalms 23, it says, you know, my cup runs over and it's because of our understanding of the love that he has for us that we can then overflow into other people. So, um, Again, this is another symbolism uh, in the Old Testament where uh, the door was actually a physical structure in the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And it was the door that led into the holy place and then into the Holy of Holies. Uh, so it was actually uh, a, a place of, or an entrance place into ourselves and, and into our heart and into our mind. So when we understand that he is the door for us to go inside and truly understand who we are, uh, Jesus was the door that led us to that place. And again, we'll talk about that in our next study. All right, uh, describe this statement, which is the resurrection and the life found in John 11. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And just, just, a, just a recollection here is this is when uh, Lazarus was raised from the dead. He was dead for four days. Uh, Jesus actually waited to go to the, the service, the funeral service or whatever, to go visit uh, Martha and Mary. And when uh, Mary approached uh, Jesus said, man, if you would have been here, he never would have died. And then Jesus' statement is, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So how does this, what does this statement mean to you? And how does this show up in your life? Through Jesus, um, we never die. Having um, heaven is within me, and that continues on after I die because of God's grace. And I, it shows up. Well, I really learned a lot about what grace is, and a lot about. I did a lot of reading about sins and how they're forgiven or remembered no more, and. Um, I think my biggest takeaway with that is just that I am not defined by my sins. Like they don't Love define it. me. Jesus yeah. does. Yes. Love it. That's really good. That's very powerful. And then because of that, then you, you're resurrected, right? Yeah. You, you're, your whole being has been resurrected. The, the thoughts that you had before about yourself, that, that it was all about, behavior modification, you know, that has all died and you've risen to a new life that, uh, that sin does not define you. That's beautiful. I love it. And you'd mentioned about, about death, uh, that heaven is in you. Um, 
you know, we're, we're so entrenched in the physical, the, the five senses. And, you know, we think that this, this physical body, right. That, uh, that when it dies, it's, it, it's over, but, uh, we're actually experiencing heaven now because the definition of heaven is where God is and where is God now he's in us and there's no separation. So if God is where heaven is, then I'm in heaven right now. And I am living the resurrected life. Excellent. And then uh, where else is this uh, symbolism used? And uh, the demonstration I had was in the, uh, the Old Testament, uh, Aaron's rod. Uh, and the way I described it was uh, Aaron's rod, which was basically a walking stick. And if ever you've seen you know, a cane or a walking stick, it's usually a piece of wood that is basically dead. And when Aaron put his rod into the tabernacle, um, along with 11 others, they were trying to decide who the leader was. Uh, Aaron's rod was the only one that budded. And basically they took a dead stick. And usually when a plant sprouts, it's in the ground, it has roots and it takes a long time. And this basically happened overnight and the stick became, it budded and actually had almonds on, was it almonds? Yeah, I think it was almonds that, uh, that sprouted uh, on it. Um, yeah, ripe almonds, uh, Numbers chapter 17. So this is, this is again, uh, you know, in ourselves, under our fallen mindset, we were basically, you know, dead. We're like this stick. But when God infuses it with his spirit, the resurrection power, then even though I'm dead, I'm alive and I can bud fruit and, and blossoms and so forth. So that's who that, but that rod of Aaron represents who we are. All right. Uh, next one. Uh, I am the good shepherd found in John chapter 10 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but the hireling who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my, sorry, I know my sheep and am known by my own. So in other words, my sheep know me and I know them. Um, so how about this statement? What does it mean to you and how does this show up in your life being the good shepherd? It just brings to mind what we had studied before with about Jesus leaving the 99 sheep to mm. go after the one. Yes. So it, gave me a better understanding of the free will that God has given me. And that even if I do wander off, Jesus will find me. He's always there for me. And then that just kind of makes me think, well, why do I want to wander off? Why would I want to go away? I could, but I have everything that I want right inside me, right where I am. So Again, I'm good. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. Life is good. What's so cool about that is it describes just how powerful God's love is and the ability for us to keep our free will, our choice, that when we fully understand the love that he does have and we freely accept it, you do come to the conclusion of, well, why would I want to do that when I have all of this? You know, this is so temporary and it's, um, so it gives us the power to overcome 
the stupid decisions that we want to make. Yeah. Yeah. And it says, well, why would I want to do that? So it keeps our free will. You could choose to do that. God, it doesn't change God's love for you at all. In fact, he'll be with you doing that thing with you. He'll be in the, he'll be there and he'll be yelling and screaming, saying, you don't want to do that. <laughs> Not a good idea. Um, you know, it, it, it you know, it, it's going to cause, you know, whatever, whatever. Because bad results. Bad uh, results. <laughs> yeah. God doesn't punish us. Our sin punishes us. Right. A lot of people think that, you know, well, God's just punishing me. He's giving me this and he's doing this to me. Um, no, God is, he's all about restoring and restoration and, and building you up. It's your decisions that cause that circumstance and, and the, the uh, consequences. Um, that's what's punishing you. Um, so back to, back to the point about not wanting to do it. Um, you know, why would I want to do that? Because, you know, God's in the background saying not a good idea and, and he'll, he'll, he'll work and try to talk to you, but you still have your free will that says, no, I'm going to do it. I hear you. I know exactly the circumstances and I'm going to do it anyways, by golly, because I think I'm going to get satisfaction from that. I need that. And then when you do it, then it's like, ah, you were right. And then it <laughs> says, all right, no problem. I still love you. Now let's, let's get you on the right path. Let's, let's, let's make this change. Let's, let's, uh, you know, talk to that certain situation or, you know, ask for forgiveness uh, from that person because you harm them, whatever it is, God never leaves us nor forsakes us. Um, and he's there always talking to us and guiding us. Because he's the good shepherd. He's leading us to green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He makes us lie down. My cup runs over. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And the other one is, you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. And what was interesting, I heard a, a message a couple of weeks ago about that. And basically, you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies is that even though we view people as our enemies, Jesus is asking us to sit down and fellowship with them and share with them the goodness that God has given to us. And by doing that, they don't become our enemies. They're, you know, um, so it's just a way of, of showing them, being that shepherd saying there's a better way, right? Um, anyways, any, any other comments on that? I know I kind of went a little long on that one, but uh, anything else? No, it's good. <clears throat> so so how, does, how does that show up in your life, being a shepherd, a good shepherd, right? So I think what I heard was what what's happening inside of you and how it's changed your view of you, but how does it show up externally? Well, I think in the same way, like a lot of these statements, it's really taught me that if I could love people, if I'm loved unconditionally, and you had mentioned this before, but um, it was something that I had written down in my shorthand. But if I could, if I'm loved unconditionally, it shows me how to love unconditionally. And knowing that Jesus is always here for me, by following that example or that, that love, I could be there just as much for someone else, someone who needs me, or maybe someone who doesn't even know they need me. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and one of the 10 truths is I will be God to someone today. So there might be a situation in your day that, uh, 
that you're expressing that love, that care for someone else, because that's what a shepherd does, right? He's caring mm -hmm. for the sheep, is um, is showing up and being God to someone. Yeah, and again, the one in ninety nine, per perfect, uh, uh, perfect illustration of that, and just the the care that he has, and then of course, you know, laying down his life for his sheep, uh, for us uh, to demonstrate that love. All right, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life found in John 14, 6. And what's interesting is this was in the upper room, and um, I think it was Thomas where Jesus was saying, you know, that I'm, I'm going to go away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. You know the way which I'm going. And, and Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. You know, where are you going? And Jesus' answer says, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, so what does this I am statement mean to you and how does this show up in your life? This one was where I really started to read a bit about the tabernacle and kind of make that connection to the tabernacle and to this statement. But um, God this is kind of a hard one for me to put into words too. So I'll try my best, but God is love and Jesus takes us there. That sounds like a song to me and maybe it is, but um, oh. that's what it, it, it just really comes down to in, in, in a little bit. But um, when, you know, like my mind starts to doubt things or to wander, that just, that's what pulls me back. And it almost seems my, my brain is kind of an all or nothing mentality. And, and I work to um, chip away at that, but this kind of seems like all or nothing. It just seems very cut and dried. You know, he is the way, the truth and the life. As my dad used to say, case closed. That yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and no one comes to the father except through me. <clears throat> yeah. And then how, how would this show up in your life? How is this demonstrated in your life being the way, the truth and the life? It reinforces my, my relationship with Jesus. Um, I've always, growing up, I never really understood God or Jesus, God or Jesus. And now I see God, Jesus, and myself, it's all connected. Or we're all connected. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, and you mentioned the uh, the tabernacle. <clears throat> Again, we'll be talking about this in the next series, but uh uh, in the uh, in the temple in the tabernacle of the Old Testament, there were three sections. There was the outer court, there was the holy place, and then there was the holy of holies. And what shows up is the way, the truth, and the life. And that when we follow the path of Christ and the things that He did for us in the outer court and then the holy place, and then the holy of holies. Uh, we see it's like a progression. When you understand the way, then you'll now understand the truth, and then you will have the life. And I think uh, you said last time that, uh, that when we have the life, then we'll understand the truth and, and show people the way. And uh, so we become this because we are living in the Holy of Holies. We are the dwelling place of God. And then we can show others the way, the way. We can set the example and be the example, just like Christ was our example. All right. I think this is the last one. I am the true vine, John 15. I am, the, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it up or lifts it up. Uh, 
every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, cleans it or purifies it, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide or remain in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So what does, what does this last statement mean to you and how does this show up in your life? Just like branches are connected to the vine, I'm connected to Jesus. Um, I'm kind of reversing one of the last verse. Um, I could do everything through Jesus, everything I need yes. to do. Mm -hmm. And it, this brings to mind to one of the, another one of the 10 truths about always being in the right place at the right time. I just have to stay in my vine and I'm right where I need to be. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah. And there are some times where it doesn't feel like we're in the right place at the right time. Yeah. You, know, you, chose, the, you chose the wrong line at the grocery store or, you know, um, you know, there's an accident on the freeway and, you know, it could be multiple things. So a lot of times for me, you know, I, I trip on it as like, ah, oh, how can this be the right place at the right time? <laughs> There's no way. But then you got to cycle it back and say, no, um, I'm always in the vine. Uh, I can do nothing without him. And, and uh, so then you start, then your eyes open and say, okay, so why did this happen? Why did I choose this? And then you look for the synchronicities. You look for the reason uh, behind it. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll say, Eight times out of 10, it comes mm -hmm. out like, wow, you know, I, I understand it now because I talked to this person or had an extra time to call somebody or whatever. The other 2% is like, I can't find a reason, but I'm sure there is. Mm -hmm. But you just trusted it, right? You trust yeah. that, that, uh, that that's true for you because you know that you are in the vine and there's no separation. And you know the uh, the the depiction here is is uh, you know we're the branch and it's the job. Maybe job's not the right word. It's the role. It's the privilege. It's the honor. And this is the way God designed it for the branch to bear the fruit. The vine isn't bearing the fruit. The branch is bearing the fruit. Now there's no separation. So I'm not saying that. That Christ doesn't also bear fruit. He does, but it's coming out of me, out of Doug, right? The branch of Doug is producing fruit because of the, the vine, the sap, the, the power, the energy, the flow is in me and it's flowing out of me. And then what's that? Did I mention it? No, I didn't. So the, the fruit is the fruit of the spirit, which is found in Galatians 5, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So that, that's the fruit that comes out of us. And I love the fact that the very first fruit is love and joy, peace, patience. I mean, quite honestly, Everything that we feel that we want or need in our life can be summed up in all those fruits. Who wouldn't want more love and joy and peace and patience and kindness? And that is the fruit of the spirit, which is in us because we are a branch in the vine. And then <clears throat> I think the statement is, you know, apart from me, you can do nothing. So think about the Aaron's rod, right? Which, which is, it was a branch at one time, right? It got cut off from the branch and then it was just a dead stick, which for this illustration, it's separated from the vine. Can that branch that's been separated bear fruit? 
And the answer is, of course not, right? It, it needs to be in the vine. It needs to be in the ground. It needs to get that nourishment. Um, so apart from me, you can do nothing. If you think that outside of doing it in your own strength, going back to the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve, they felt that in their own strength, because the temptation was, hey, you eat of this fruit <clears throat> and you'll become like God. So they reached out in their own strength and, and their own knowledge of what they felt was right and wrong. And they took it and they ate. And in a sense, they felt that they could do it on their own. So they separated from the vine. And then, you know, because that was their mindset. But the beauty about that is Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He can take that branch that's been cut off and he can attach it back to the vine, you know, and there's resurrection power. Um, so nothing is dead in God's eyes. Everything is alive with his resurrection power. All right, so that is I am the vine and that concludes it. So uh, before we go into our, our conclusion here, um, any final comments, uh, any statement or something that, that sticks out in your mind that's like, this one was really powerful for me? I think they we're all powerful in, in different ways, but um, I guess my biggest takeaway from this whole lesson would be, um, I've always known God's love is how powerful it is, but the more I learn, <laughs> the more powerful and all encompassing it, it becomes to me. And um, it's just really a, a beautiful, a beautiful time in my life right now, studying this, especially, it just really means a lot. And yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, all emotional here, but. <laughs> just knowing that there is no separation there's nothing that you can do to change his love for you. He loves you completely, wholly. And he's, he's right, right in you. He's right there. Yeah. Awesome. So we go through this uh, each, uh, each week and it, it talks about the 30, 60 and a hundred fold. And that's what a hundred fold journey is all about. It's, it's, where, what does our identity look like as a hundredfold? And what are the tools and resources um, that we have that remind us of who we already are? And when I say the word remind, notice I didn't say what we need to do in order to get to a hundredfold. There's nothing that we need to do. We are already there, but we just don't believe it. So what are the differences between the 30, 60, and 100-fold? Uh, the 30-fold, uh, they live in the outer court, and they live in a work-based religion, if you will, or work-based God. They believe that the name I am only belongs to God, not me. I mean, that's sacrilege. It, I will experience I am completely when I get to heaven. Until then, I trust and obey. There's that song, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, right? Um, that's the 30-fold. It's all about what they need to do, and heaven is in the future. It's not now. 60-fold is, uh, they, they're also work-based, um, but they're more on the supernatural, right? They, they understand the spirits in them. Uh, I am is Holy Spirit who is in me. When I call upon him, he can give me supernatural power to do amazing things. So the spirit kind of comes and goes, and there's things that they need to do in order to draw upon that power. But uh, So it's available to them, but they, there are things that they need to do fast and pray and, and uh, you know, just do all the things for spirit to fill them completely. Whereas a hundredfold, the understanding that hundredfold has is I am is me. I am, I am. I am is me. 
all of these truths are true for me. There is nothing I need to do, just rest in the truth of knowing that I am. And there's our illustration, that farmer, right? Where he plants the seeds and then they grow. How it happens, they, you know, I, I don't know. The, the, the when and the how is not up to me. It's the what, that's what's important. What do I want? What, what's needed? And then you rest. But just resting and knowing that all these truths that are true for you, we can rest in that and live from the light, not in that darkness, because our understanding has been uh, has been turned on. But you have to ask yourself the question: How good is God? God, come on, are you telling me that there's nothing that I can do that separates me from from God? I mean, I know what I did yesterday, and that was not worthy of his love. And how you answer this question determines your yield. So each one of these has their yield, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Um, they have a yield, right? So the church out there, religion out there, you know, they do some good things. Um, but the 100 fold does it easily, naturally. It's what Christ did when he was here. That is the... The, produ uh, the production, that's, that's what was produced. And am I saying that we don't do anything? We just sit and, and relax all the time? No, Jesus was very busy doing things, but he was only doing things that he saw the Father doing, and he said the things that he heard the Father say. So he was in a state of rest because he wasn't worried about when he went to a city, you know, what was he going to do when he got there? He was just listening and watching. Okay, you know, what's next, God? This is so amazing. I love this life. Thank you, God. And then all of a sudden, a blind man comes up to him and says, Jesus, heal me. And he saw that as God saying, hey, go heal that man. So he wasn't worried about healing anybody in the city. It wasn't until the circumstance and the situation uh, came to him that he reacted. And that came from a state of rest for him. So yes, Jesus was very busy. He did a lot of things, but he did it from a state of rest, not anxiousness or worried, you know, what am I going to do for you, God, today? You know, what can I do to be obedient? No, he, he knew that there was nothing that he could do that would change it. And then as life came to him, he would see that as God revealing it to him. And that's the way we live our life today is in that same manner, just in a state of rest, not anxious about tomorrow, but just focused on today and resting and knowing that you're loved. And then as circumstances and situations come to you, you say, okay, God, you know, I see that now come into my life and how, how should I react? What should I say? And the answer is always love, right? Your response should always be love, love that person, love that situation, love yourself because circumstances don't matter. Only state of being matters. So is God really that good? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. So this is just a reminder to continue uh, to work on the 10 truths. And so here we are. We made it through. Congratulations. You've graduated. Yay. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, so next week, we're going to be talking on a new study called I'm the Dwelling Place of God. So be looking for the worksheet, the study guide for that, which is on the uh, the hundredfoldjourney.com. And this is this is what we're going to be talking about. And and by the way, this is um, um, memory verses that I would like uh, for us to memorize. First John, uh, sorry, first John, first Corinthians 3:16, you are God's temple and God's spirit lives in you. And John 17, 22, I have given them the glory, the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. So these are verses just to memorize and uh, reminding ourselves. This is the manna, right, that comes from heaven. It's God's word, which is the manna. And when we have that memorized, then it's in us, right? And, and we can call upon that uh, in the future. That's why we memorize Bible verses is because it's manna. It's food for us. 
So this is what we have to look forward to. We're gonna be talking about uh, all of this, uh, which also includes this. So the first week we're gonna talk about the bronze altar uh, and then the bronze laver, table of showbread, golden lampstand, altar of incense, Ark of the Covenant, and uh, mercy seat. And again, the worksheet is gonna be found on our website. And if you have any questions or comments, you can reach out to us on Facebook. Okay, that, uh, that concludes it for this morning. Thank you for hanging. I know we kind of went a little long, so uh, thanks for uh, being part of this series and uh, your insights and, and comments have been very, uh, very helpful. So really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Doug. All right, have a good rest of your day. You too, bye-bye. All right, bye-bye now.